having me so it is a Saturday and I haven't slept for seven days for a deadline so we're going to take it nice and slow um, although I do speak super super fast so just feel free to shout up if anyone doesn't understand anything or wants me to go over anything again um, so yeah so my company is called The Unseen and um, I've pretty much spent the whole of my life I just turned 30 and I've never had a job so that would be uh, kind of where we're at now uh, parents you know they're still proud <laughs> so so I'll talk you through this and um and I guess explain a little bit why I've kind of always just made my own way in the world and done my own thing. Um, the company is called The Unseen because we generally like to visualize unseen stuff within the environment or the human or different things uh, going on that your eyes, your ears, your nose, your mouth um, can't see or, he or hear or perceive. Um, but I'll start with this. To explore The Unseen. A house fusing matter into material. We investigate the unseen world around us by stepping beyond sensory experience and taking knowledge out of research and into material. We fuse scientific study with creativity to enhance matter at the hidden level. We offer this discovery to you through our art and through performance. The world is full of unseen magic. We invite you to see the unseen. Okay, so I always like to play that, firstly because it gives me a little bit of a break on the intro, uh, and secondly because I don't like any, from watching that I would hope that none of you uh, are really thinking about science or about wearable tech or any really part, you know, uh, chemical substance going out there. So um, that's kind of the, the basis of the company is we don't like uh, to reveal our technology as technology. We really believe that technology should be invisible and it should be unseen, um, and if anything it should be perceived as magic. Um, so I founded The Unseen a year and a half ago, and this was the team then, uh, there's three of us, there's now 15 of us, um, and it was essentially a, an artist collective that I wanted to form, and I, I got all of these different people that I'd met in my sort of 10 years of going through different industries as a self-employed uh, material alchemist. Um, and found all the kind of weirdos that don't really fit the system. So that might have been a coder who couldn't code, or a pattern cutter who couldn't cut clothes, or a, um, a singer that didn't want to sing anymore, um, or didn't want to do it in the way that, that the system told them that they should do it. Um, and we all got together and just thought, right, come on, let's see if we can create something or, or an impact within um, fashion, within, within art, within music, uh, and within technology, but do it in a, in a way that people aren't expecting. So it all started with this jacket 10 years ago. Um, and while well, I was studying textiles uh, up at Manchester and got quite ill, so I uh, went to um, hospital and spent a long time in hospital. And by the time I came out of hospital, I didn't want to um, do textiles in the way that textiles is. You know, I didn't want to just create clothing for the catwalk anymore. I wanted to create something with a little bit more meaning. Um, so I changed my course and went to study chemistry instead and, went and started to look at how you could use materials um, in the, to, to speak for you or to, to highlight things that um, perhaps could you know, give you an early warning system if you were going to get ill or give you uh, an indication of how your spine or how your sort of uh, muscles are performing. Um, at the time, I was working on a project with uh, the Royal Society of Arts um, around pollution and around um, carbon emissions in the atmosphere. And I thought, what if you could create... Well, originally, I thought it was actually aimed at, at you guys, uh, around, well, 16 to 18-year-olds and how you could stop them from smoking. Uh, and I thought, OK, cool. So if you, if you have a cigarette um, that bleaches your mouth or makes your mouth go a certain colour after you've had a cheeky faggot on your lunch break, A, your teachers are going to know you've smoked and B, you're not going to look too cool. Um, so I thought, well, how can you do that? And really knock down the doors and, uh, and managed to create this compound, which did change colour uh, in different carbon emissions. And then I thought, cool, well, if you can put it into a cigarette, why can't you put it into clothing? And then why can't you put it into materials that are surrounding uh, around you so you can visually see? Because there's no point in me sort of going on and on at you uh, about data streams. You know, data is almost invisible, too invisible. If you can see that data, it's much more powerful. So, which was this compound here. So this is a jacket and a material which absorbs air pollution but also changes colour. So it goes from yellow to black so that you know how much carbon emission you've absorbed around your body each day. And then when you go into a less, less dense uh, polluted atmosphere, the, the jacket then reverses itself back to yellow. So that was a real sort of um, turning point in my career, I guess. And when, when people saw this, they really began to sort of 
have you know a response to the carbon emission around them, and, and it really had an effect. Um, so I stopped. Uh, well, I mean, it was quite successful. I, I travelled around the world, um, putting this sort of thing into materials, but mostly into concretes and car converters, catalytic converters. As a 21-year-old, it wasn't very sexy working with a load of sort of 50-year-old men <laughs> in the science industry. So I went back to the Royal College of Arts to study textiles and to try and marry up the different uh, aesthetics that I was working with and the compounds that I was creating scientifically to try and come up with um, a narrative and a story and a material that was much more uh, beautiful and much more uh, able to cross over into the fashion world uh, as opposed to the science world. And this is what I graduated with, which was kind of like a, a series of compounds which could track up to seven different parameters in the environment um, that was uh, impregnated into a feather. So these feathers change colour from black uh, through to greens, uh, reds, yellows, purples, whites, dependent on different UV levels, heat levels, moisture levels, sound waves, uh, pollution um, and friction within the atmosphere. Um, and I can show you one of them changing here, but this was where the research was at sort of fifth... Uh, five, six years ago. So just as the wind passes across these feathers, you get a, uh, a blue to white colour change shift. So after I graduated, I then went uh, to work back into to science. So I went um, to the Royal Academy of Engineering and started to work on um, different materials for the future home uh, and was ended up sort of designing planes and design like interiors on the plane, design working for people like Will I Am doing Internet of Things connected products uh, and just didn't really find the industry very thriving. I think um, there's so much happening in the industry and kind of one advice I would give to you guys is to really sort of stay true to what you believe in and don't just sort of get swept up in the motion of uh, the machine because it's pretty chaotic out there. Um, and then this happened, so Kate Moss um, Tim, and Tim Walker, who is a, a great, is a great fashion photographer, shot one of my pieces. Um, and at this point I thought, why am I consulting for all these massive brands, doing good, you know, doing, creating their materials and not really doing it for myself and sort of giving it away. So I decided that I was going to like lock down and try and create my own thing in my own house so I had control over the science that I was creating but also the design that I was creating. Um, so in kind of true style, I threw a massive funeral and killed off my consultancy company. Um, so we had the Shoreditch Box Park, um, which was the diesel... Uh, box at the time and um, we worked with them and we, we decked the whole box out as a church and then we invited all of these amazing scientists and amazing designers and all of these people I've been working with in the industry down to a performance uh, where I basically told them I was never going to work for them again <laughs> but, that I, but that I would be coming up with something um, and we got people like um, Hendrix Gin to sponsor it and we got uh, Ray's Light to come and do the, the songs and the hymns and it was a kind of real I don't know, it was, it was a wrapped up way of, of killing a company and also telling your employers you're not going to work for them. But also for me, uh, personally, if it kind of gave me a reason to, to step back from the industry because it's so easy to get that. You get so taken in on it and on a, on a, a tidal wave of all this stuff and, and working so hard that it's hard to remember what your dream was. So I thought if I can have this performance where you know, I, I say I'm going to do this and I'm, and I'm going to stop working in the materials industry, it gave me an excuse not to go back to it. So for me, I had to physically create a song and dance about it so I wouldn't uh, change my path, I guess. Um, and then uh, I decided to dress in black. So um, we did the Victorian morning tradition and part of my sort of statement to myself that I wasn't going to go back and consult was to... Um, do this colour palette which is like mo mo Victorian morning tradition is like black uh, then yellow then grey um, and I thought I would do it for like you know two weeks or something and carry on and it's now been two and a half years <laughs> so I'm getting a bit better for black yeah. but, um, but on Thursday we changed to a different colour so that's going to be fun um, but literally um, I did this more from a marketing perspective so a kind of way there's a method to the madness in that if you dress like this so long and you go to so many conferences and you network people start to recognise you um, so then you can, it's much easier for some reason to get interviews or to get into press or to kind of, um, just people just remember you. So it, even though it seems a little bit sort of why would you do that, it really, really has helped. Um, and the same with all the company. The company have, it's a bit like Star Trek, we all have uniforms and depending on how long you've been with the company, you have a different colour and there's kind of a story behind every element to the, to the brand and yeah, it's, it seems to be working. Um, so at this point we launched The Unseen, so this was a year later after uh, killing the company um, and I had to sign on because I had no sort of a livelihood and uh, no, well I had education but just couldn't find a job, it was really difficult three years ago to find a job 
um, and then I applied for an award with the government, with the Technology Strategy Board, which was to create a digital innovation within fashion and it took forever to apply, to apply for and I didn't have sort of anyone to help me do that. Um, but then anyway, I managed to win the award, which gave me a little bit of seed funding to set something up and to create this sort of innovation within fashion. Um, and so once we got that, we, we then managed to blag a studio at Somerset House. And again, this was from going to loads and loads of meetings and just networking and networking and sort of, yeah, not letting people, not say, letting people say no to you is really kind of, you know, we'd won this award, but we had nowhere to do the work. So the award was given in Somerset House. So we just sort of said, is there anywhere we could set up? We'll renovate it. We'll get our friends to come in and paint it. And that's sort of very much how we, we got, got this space and turned it into creative studio. Uh, so this was a, an event that we had uh, when we launched the NC and we launched the technology and we didn't want to launch it in your traditional go to a sort of technology conference um, so we held uh, this ritual underneath Somerset House um, where we showcased our sculpture um, which had was impregnated with our, our um, ink. So this was a compound that tracks many different things but this particular sculpture that the model was wearing purely tracks heat um, so we made a big leather shell and then did the obvious thing of setting the model on fire. Um, and then when the flames had sort of all propagated down, you had all these beautiful uh, blues and reds and greens upon the sculpture. And, and again, we worked with Hendrix Jean and we got musicians to come in and did it as a real sort of performance to launch the technology. Uh, and we had uh, like Dezine covered it, Wired covered it, lo loads of different people covered it. But, um, and I remember the BBC saying, this, as we got, this is the first time we've ever covered an exorcism. And it was kind of, it was funny, but that was on BBC Click. So it was a kind of like real, um, people seem to adopt with it and, and want to come and see it. Because from a technology perspective or a kind of, uh, to do something more artistic, challenge them. So they were interested. So you get the top tier media people coming because they were like, seriously, I don't, I've just had an invite, a lighter appear on my desk with an invite. So they were interested. So it sparked intrigue. Um, but really what we were showcasing was this compound. So this um, was a, it's a series of sculptures, but originally we were working for Formula One to track the uh, aerodynamic around a car. Uh, so we wanted to see how much uh, friction passed across the surface, but wanted to see it in real time as opposed to seeing it on a digital um, system within the wind tunnel. So I created a compound which would track friction, give you different color gradients depending on how much pressure was, uh, or how much friction ran across the surface of the car. So when we launched the Unseen, I wanted to, to, to show people that. And uh, this garment's all leather, and it's um, all handcrafted and hand-stitched. And the reason it's sort of got fins is because what you don't see around the body normally is the, that uh, you, you walk through your, your sort of atmosphere, and you get a shift across of um, air pressure across your shoulder, which then comes behind your shoulders, kind of like angel wings. So these fins cut through that and help with the turbulence. So as you're walking about your atmosphere, you then get these... Um, blues and greens and reds, depending on how much friction is passed across the surface. Um, but it's not very controllable, it's really chaotic. Um, and I can show you in this video here. Um, literally, like, if the wind hits it, it just does its own thing. So we filmed these, and again, we, we, as we, when we started off, we had no money or anything in the company. So we just filmed these on, you know, like a normal Canon DS in our studio. It wasn't um, anything, there's no CGI or anything. It's just purely just as it, as it happens as it, as it goes. So this is kind of like a really slow, gentle breeze. And this is a, the shell, a more of a shell-like sister sculpture. Um, so you can see the wind really pass across it quite uh, smoothly. And you can see as the friction hits it, you get these different color gradients. But as I said, that sculpture is really uncontrollable. So the scientist part of me and I guess the control freak was like, how do we make this more? How do we predict what colors this is going to become and how do we control it? So we started to make a compound, uh, which is in this sculpture, which um, changes to not just air pressure anymore, it changes to um, UV and also moisture. So throughout the seasons, um, we worked uh, with a great uh, sort of data collection agency for the weather and we predicted what the weather patterns would be for the next sort of five years and made the jacket able to change colour uh, in the winter it's blue, in the spring it's green, in the summer it's red uh, and through to autumn and then it refreshes itself again um, in black once it gets rid of the coldest temperatures of the year. 
um, and we also did a 24 hour version of this so it changes 24 hours so you sort of in the morning is one colour so it tracks the heat of the day, the light levels of the day and the humidity so um, throughout the sort of 24 hour period you get these different colour shifts and we just um, also did a, a drape line which isn't in the uh, the presentation with Liberty uh, London so it's a, a, a series of drapes which do, do the same thing so they're one colour in um, summer and another colour in autumn and, and so forth. Um, we also create uh, this, this sculpture we were challenged by the, bar the Barbican um, to create a sculpture with a digital aspect to what we do because everything I've shown you so far is purely chemical um, and so we thought well we know what the, the environment of earth is but how can we um, take that to the next step. So we, we obviously was wanting to track space weather, so how can we look at what the weather and what the environment patterns are in space? Um, so we worked with four different agencies, so like NASA, the European Space Agency, scraped some off, offline and then an independent one. Um, and we, we wanted to track the northern lights, so the aurora borealis, um, solar flares, magnetic um, storms, and then code a hidden Easter egg into this uh, garment that when there was a solar eclipse, the garment would go white. Um, so we did that, uh, that's travelling at the moment, it was, in, it was in the Digital Revolution exhibition uh, last year and depending on what happens in the cabinet, um, what's happening in space, this data gets pulled in uh, off this live website which you can go on to um, and ch changes the, the atmosphere of the cabin dependent on what is most active in space at that time. So if it's the solar flares then you get the solar flares appear on the garment, if it's the aurora brellius you get more of a northern lights type effect. Uh, and if it's solar wind, you get a sort of, yeah, you see the turbulence. So you can correlate that data visually onto the um, garment. Uh, we then um, did a massive collaboration with Swarovski Gemstones. Um, so Swarovski came to us and asked us whether we would uh, work with them to make them appear more as a smart material as opposed to a blingy kind of phone cover <laughs> and, um, or a jewelry piece. Uh, so we were really intrigued by their uh, ability to GM modify stones, so to be able to lab grow gemstones uh, and also modify them, um, which I don't really think we should be fearing, and I, but I do think we shouldn't be growing them to look good. We should be growing them and creating them to have something fused within them that doesn't already have, um, that nature can't, can't let it have. So this was the uh, product of the collaboration. Uh, it's a 4,000 piece Spinel uh, encrusted uh, gemstone head, headdress um, and this, we picked the spinel stone, the love-grown spinel stone because it's super conductive so it actually is in a lot of printed circuit boards which is in wearable technology but we enhanced it so it had really really great temperature monitoring, monitor, uh, temperature absorption um, and we formulated a compound that could change colour within 0.4 of a degree through four colour hues so depending on what area of the brain is active you generate different um, heat patterns, so you can pick these up on, I think Wired actually did a, an amazing article on that, you can pick it up off online, um, and essentially what this piece does is correlate that through the brain, the, as you're, how you're feeling uh, and, and what, where is active in your brain, correlate it through the gemstones so you get a unique patination across your headdress uh, in the areas where your brain is active. So it might be blue, it might be greens, loads of different colours. So everyone who's worn this piece has generated uh, their own pattern. No, one, no one's ever had the same patination um, and everyone's had slightly different colours. So this model is uh, lots of blues and greens, whereas we had Jessie J in it who went a lot of red, um, which I'm not allowed to swarm by secrecy to not explain why that is. Um, and, and so yeah, so down the back of the, the brain, uh, down the back of the brain here, if your eyes are open or if your eyes are shut, you generate very slight temperature shifts. Uh, this is picked up on the headpiece. So this was a great sort of collaboration because it was two worlds coming together that could achieve different things, but giving it an application. And we, we put it out as an art piece, uh, but since then we've been doing um, a documentary with King's College Neuro Department to see if we can use colour as a way to monitor patients that might be in comas or are in different sort of uh, unable to communicate what is happening within their brain. But this piece doesn't tell you what um, you're thinking, it just tells you where is active. Uh, so the next step was obviously to, oh, I, I'll talk about that at the end, um, was to, uh, so these are all products, um, it sounds a bit trivial after showing you that, but um, these were all products that we launched um, off the back of the AIR project, which um, are all sort of elements within our uh, philosophy that we didn't want to say whether we were a fashion company or whether we were a materials company. So we created seven products that were infused with our unseen magic and um, we, we opened a shop in Somerset House and all the products sold out like within a week. So since then we've, we've been working on a collection which launches in Selfridges on Thursday so you can go and play with it all. Um, 
But the piece I was going to get to is this piece. So this was the, the sort of clever cousin of the air trio. So they, um, whereas the air, air collection and the Swarovski piece is all chemical, um, this is a digitally controlled uh, piece. So it has a membrane of printed electronics throughout it. Um, and we, we created an electronically activated ink. Um, so um, obviously, being the unseen, wanted to see human auras uh, or the EEG. So one step on from the brain, um, we wanted to ask our patients or our wearers to um, wear an EEG head kit uh, and but wear this piece. And then at the same time as wearing this piece, it translates um, your physical emotion at that time into different colors. So if you're happy or you're sad, you get these blues and reds. If you're feeling quite chilled, you get whites. Um, but essentially, this is a concept piece, but essentially what we've created is a, a woven surface that can change its color via a mobile phone app. So it's not, it's not lights, it's all um, dyes. So essentially you can you know, down, down, download whatever color you want and change the color of your bag or whatever, car. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's kind of, oh yeah, and we give you this um, readout of your brain state at the end as a kind of, whether you'd want to see it or not, I'm not sure. So that kind of comes, brings me to the end. Um, yeah, so a lot, all of this stuff is kind of, quite, this was just quite conceptual, but um, as of Thursday, it's all, you can buy it all. So it's all kind of out in the real world and ready to like, be used. So yeah, thank you. Um, what advice would you give to people who want to go into fashion, but as you were saying, maybe want to have sort of like a more technical or ethical mm -hmm. side to it? And things? Yeah, I'd say it was really difficult for me going from chemistry over to textiles. So I remember at the time I was the first student at the Royal College of Art ever to get into textiles without a material piece of material in my folder. Um, but I think if you've got a good, if you've backed it up with good research, so if you want to kind of, if you've got a good idea, a strong idea, and you've managed to back it up with research and spoke to the right people, then you know it's credit, it's it's achievable to do. I think you just have to believe that you can do it, and I guess yeah, just they can only say no, right? So yeah, if you're passionate, yeah. Do you think that more clothes are going to be like this in the future? Do you see like? Mm, I I don't I don't. So I mean, I, pers I probably shouldn't say this, but personally, I wouldn't wear any of that. <laughs> but. <laughs> But, um, but I, I, I think that clothing is going to stay exactly the same, and I think that wearable technology is going to stay exactly the same. I mean, I'm probably the only wearable... I get thrown into every wearable conference under the sun, and I'm always the ones there saying, can we just show up about it? Because if you think of somebody like Marks & Spencer, they, they've, they've been using material, like nano surfaces on their materials for years and years and years, and they've managed to integrate a technology into clothing without singing a song and dance about it, and are having commercial success from it. So if you create a garment that is... Um, going to benefit someone's life in some way, then people will buy it. You know, it's not about creating a fad; it's about creating something that gives you a little bit more. I would say. Okay, so maybe we'll sneak in under the radar. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, give cool. will everyone give Lauren Booker a huge round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>